Good evening, everybody. Hi, it's Susan Thornton, and welcome to our April edition of our Facebook Live programs. And tonight we have what I think will be a very interesting topic for everybody. We're going to talk all about itch. And joining me this evening is Dr. John Zick from Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. Hello, Dr. Zick. Hi, Susan. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And I will just share, um, when we asked Dr. Zick if he would be interested in joining us for one of our Facebook Lives, and I said, would you, what topic would you like to talk about? And he said, itch. Let's talk about itch. So I think it's um, obviously a big topic, a lot to talk about, and one that is uh, pretty frustrating for a lot of people with this disease. And, you know, I, sometimes it's very interesting when I talk to folks and they say, well, I've never had any itch. So maybe we can talk a little bit about why some people might itch and why some people don't itch. But mm -hmm. at any rate, it's really great to have you. Thank you for joining us. And I know you have a presentation that you're going to take us through. And uh, we might try a few new things tonight, folks. So um, hang in there with us as we, as we try to make our program a little bit more interactive. So from here, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zick, and he's going to take us on a interesting journey with itch. <laughs> well, thank you, Susan. It's uh, my pleasure to be here as part of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation uh, Facebook Live presentations. Um, and today we're going to be walking you through how I manage itch in patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And those little words you see on my title slide are actually um, the translation of itch in about 25 different languages. So if you speak a language other than English, you may see the word for itch um, in your culture. Uh, the next slide that I'm going to show you here in just a second, I'm going to walk you through some of the objectives that I hope to accomplish during the next 20 to 30 minutes. I hope that you gain a better and deeper understanding of itch in general, and I want you to gain a deeper understanding of itch in patients with cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And hopefully, with that deeper understanding, um, you'll be better able to manage itch more effectively. <clears throat> but first, I wanted to start with um, what is itch? And if you think about it, um, itch is a pretty hard sensation to define. Um, and at this point, I was wondering if perhaps some of the listeners um, could type in the little text box how they would define itch. Pretend that you're uh, meeting someone for the first time who's never experienced the sensation of itch. How would you define it? Yeah, and Maybe if I'll you ask Susan if to you... define it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's such a hard thing. Um, I know how I've described it when my itch was at its worst was um, the only way I could really describe it to people where they would understand it was that it felt like ants crawling from the mm -hmm. inside out in my skin. Like you, and you just, like just mm -hmm. tiny, all these tiny little feet that you couldn't get to. You know, it was yeah. just um, really, really challenging. So, uh, and, and I, you know, that, that sort of got the point across, but unless right. you've actually had the experience, um, I think it's hard. For people to understand they're like oh just throw some benadryl on it and there we go right no i so i certainly agree it's yeah. difficult to define itch um most people um would perhaps define it as uh, a very uncomfortable sensation but just about everyone could distinguish itch from pain from cold from heat from vibration those are some of the major sensations that we have in in our skin and if you look at some uh, dictionary definitions of itch, it's often just described as an uncomfortable sensation that compels you to scratch. Um, and that's kind of a weird definition uh, for a sensation. But that is um, perhaps the best definition that I've found for, for itch. And so another question could be, why do we itch? Um, is there an important, maybe an evolutionary reason why we itch? Because humans and other animals have all evolved to itch. 
And um, this is just some animals here that we've all seen before, a dog, a cat, a mouse, and um, many mammals and also other animals certainly scratch and itch. Um, and I think that one reason why we itch um, and maybe from an evolutionary standpoint is to scratch off pests and irritants on our skin that could lead to diseases and maybe even damage the skin. So um, that's probably why we itch to attract us and compel us to scratch the skin in certain areas. But unfortunately, over time, many skin diseases have evolved to that trigger itch. And eczema, many people were probably diagnosed with eczema before mycosis fungoides. Uh, poison ivy is another dermatitis that leads to itching. Psoriasis, again, another disease that many patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma were diagnosed with before uh, the ultimate cutaneous lymphoma diagnosis. Subarachic dermatitis is another uh, common skin disease. And this is uh, the, a disease that usually manifests with scaling on the scalp, um, dandruff. And then finally, and uh, without further ado, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So we're gonna be focusing a lot on cutaneous lymphoma for the rest of the talk. Um, but first, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the neurobiology of itch. So how do we sense itch? Because if we can understand this better, we should be able to treat it better. And the players are cells in our skin. There are many different cell types in our skin, and many of these cells secrete little molecules that um, we'll just call them itch molecules. They're also called pruritogens. And these molecules can stimulate itch nerves to send a signal through the spinal thalamic tract all the way up to our brain. So it goes from skin to itch nerve to spinal cord, spinal thalamic tract up to our brain. And this little cartoon shows you a little depiction of how this works. Um, so you can imagine using or targeting rather all of these different aspects of the sensation of itch in the treatment of itch. A lot of people just focus on the skin, but there are many other targets uh, to help relieve itch. The next question um, is why do we scratch itch? And it's true that originally we were scratching our skin to remove pests and irritants, but everyone knows that if you have an itch and you scratch it, the itch kind of goes away, it gets better. And the reason why scratching helps itch is because scratching causes pain or discomfort in the skin and pain blocks that itch signal from reaching the brain. So let's go back to this diagram and the little animation I have. And that orange red lightning bolt is the pain that we cause when we scratch the skin deeply. Um, and you could see that pain is carried to the brain through specific nerves just to sense and transmit pain, just as there are specific nerves to transmit itch. And what happens is um, as we scratch the skin, there's kind of a race between the pain nerve and the itch nerve to see who could get to the spinal cord first. But the pain nerve has a kind of a sneaky way of blocking the itch signal to our brain. So that's really why we scratch. We scratch to induce pain, and then pain blocks our itch signal. Um, and so the question might be, is it okay to scratch? And the answer is yes. I don't want anyone listening and looking at this internet session here to think that they should feel guilty for scratching their skin that itches. And I think that's an important lesson for the uh, caregivers that are also uh, listening to this talk because um, it's a, a compelling uh, movement to scratch our skin once our skin starts to itch. But do I recommend that we scratch to relieve itch? And the answer is no. And the answer is no, Susan, and everyone else listening, because there are better ways to relieve itch than scratching. Of course, if you scratch too deeply, um, you can damage your skin. You can also, it can also lead to potentially um, infections, and uh, that is something we certainly want to avoid in our patients with cutaneous lymphoma. So let me go back to the presentation now and talk a little bit about what causes itch and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And unfortunately, we don't have this figured out completely, but we do know that there are specific cells in the skin of patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that are probably responsible for itch. The first are the malignant T-cells themselves. They secrete 
a molecule called interleukin-31. And this can actually stimulate itch nerves to fire and send the signal to our brain. There are also cells called eosinophils. And eosinophils secrete uh, proteins called proteases and nerve growth factor that can also stimulate itch nerves. Then we have mast cells. And mast cells, you might remember, are cells that are responsible for allergic reactions in the skin. And mast cells are the primary depository of histamine. So when a mast cell releases histamine, that histamine travels in the skin where it stimulates an itch nerve to send an itch signal to the brain. So we have here just five of many molecules that can cause itching and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So as you might expect, we can try to develop medications to target these molecules and hopefully get a better handle on itch. Okay, now what you've been waiting for is um, how I manage itch in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And this pyramid of itch management that I'm about to introduce you to uh, can be used for patients who have atopic eczema, psoriasis, and many other diseases where we see itch. And the foundation of this pyramid is good skin care. Without good skin care, many of the other treatments that we have for itch are not going to work as effectively. And so I have an entire slide that I'm going to walk you through about what I mean by good skin care. The next treatment that we would probably use to manage itch would be topical treatments. These include prescription and non-prescription topical treatments. And then we would probably turn to oral treatments or pills to manage itch. Um, and I'm not talking about steroid pills because I only reserve those for the most desperate patients with itch. There's something called wet wrap therapy um, that can be highly effective. It takes a little bit more labor. It's more labor intensive, so I don't often um, suggest it early on, especially for mild itch, but it certainly can help patients with more severe itch. And then there's phototherapy. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. The fact that phototherapy can help both cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and itch makes it an ideal treatment for many patients. Systemic steroids are helpful in the management of itch. However, um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the disadvantages of using systemic steroids um, in a few slides. And then finally, we have some investigational treatments that I'm going to talk about um, in managing itch. And um, these are treatments that are not FDA approved but may hold promise for patients. So there's a lot of hope out there um, for patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma who are suffering from itch. So let's start by talking a little bit about good skin care. I would say that the most important takeaways about good skin care is to make sure that whenever you're bathing or showering, that you use lukewarm water, not hot water, and that you choose fragrance-free products. And um, showering may have an advantage over bathing, because you're less likely to wash up some of the natural oils on your skin. So you wanna to try to avoid hot water. It's important to use a mild, fragrance-free or unscented skin cleanser. I have a few brand names listed there, but I have no conflict of interest. Um, and uh, mo more importantly would be to lubricate the skin several times daily with a fragrance-free emollient. And by emollient, I'm simply referring to lotions, creams, and ointments that are used to lubricate the skin, to replenish the skin of its natural oils. And so it is important, though, um, for some patients to lubricate their skin many times a day in order to replenish that natural oil layer. And then I have a few other bullet points here. Um, lubricating the skin while it's damp after showering is more effective than lubricating the skin while it's dry. Consider using a fragrance-free laundry detergent, trying to avoid fabric softener and dryer sheets. So you might be wondering, what is it about fragrance that can aggravate itch? Well, it turns out that fragrances are irritants to the skin, and uh, fragrances can trigger an allergic reaction in the skin. So on top of irritating the skin and um, triggering allergies, fragrances can um, certainly aggravate itch. As a matter of fact, in the general population, the most common cause of itch is dry skin. And if many of those patients followed the uh, tips here on this slide, they can often relieve their itch. So now let's talk a little bit about non-prescription topicals for itch. These are products that you might have at home 
are products that you certainly can purchase without a prescription at a local pharmacy. And the first one may surprise you, ice. I think ice is a wonderful treatment for itch. And you can either put some ice cubes in a uh, Ziploc bag or use a bag of frozen vegetables. Um, I like peas and corn because they're kind of small, kind of feels good when it's applied to the skin. And you could simply wrap an ice pack or a bag of frozen vegetables with a paper towel and ice down the itchiest spot on your skin. So how does this work? Well, it turns out that cold can also induce pain, which can block the itch sensation. The nice thing about ice is it melts. And because ice melts at room temperature, the chance of you harming your skin by applying an ice cube to it is about zero. Um, so think about applying ice to those itchiest areas on your skin. You can also use menthol containing emollients. Um, menthol is very interesting. It's an extract from mint leaves, and it has this property of stimulating cold nerves, which end up causing some discomfort or pain that can actually block the itch sensation. And some examples are listed on the slide of some brand name products that contain menthol that may be helpful. And then there's good old hydrocortisone. 1% cream is available over the counter in the United States and elsewhere. Um, the nice thing about hydrocortisone 1% cream is it's very mild. So it's safe for application on the face, the genital area, and skin folds because it does not cause skin thinning, even if applied once or twice daily. And then finally, permoxine. Permoxine is an interesting ingredient. It's a topical anesthetic, so it transiently numbs the skin um, and the nerves that cause pain and itch. Um, and it's not, um, I would say, the, the very best topical treatment, um, but it's nice to have a variety of treatments around because you may have an itchy spot that might respond respond to promoxine containing emollients on one day, and maybe you'll find that menthol works better on other days, or perhaps menthol in the summer and promoxine during the winter. So you can kind of play around with this. Unfortunately, every patient's uh, sensation of itch um, can be different, and so you'll have to experiment a little bit to find out what works best for you. And so now um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some prescription products that you can use uh, for itch, um, and these are the topical steroids. So what I have listed in this table are probably among the three most prescribed topical steroids to manage itch. And they're really the top three uh, because of their cost more than anything else. Hydrocortisone, 2.5% ointment and cream is a low-strength topical steroid. It's pretty cheap. You can get a one-pound jar for about $25 cash um, at, at some of your local pharmacies. And it's pretty safe. It's safe for the face and skin folds because it's low potency. And what you can see in this table is that the higher the potency of the topical steroid, the more likely it is to thin your skin. And so what I mean by thinning is I mean that the skin can get shiny and kind of wrinkly like tissue paper. And in some cases, you can even develop stretch marks. So you have to look out for that. However, in patients that are suffering with itch, um, I think using topical steroids are a great, a great option. Um, so in the middle column of this table is triamcinolone ointment and cream, and that's the workhorse of dermatology. There are probably gallons and hundreds of gallons of triamcinolone prescribed every day by dermatologists. And one reason why we like triamcinolone is because it's medium strength, so it's slightly more effective to help itch than hydrocortisone. Um, it's very inexpensive. It's probably less expensive than hydrocortisone. And um, because it's medium strength, um, it's safe for the trunk, that is the chest, abdomen, and back, and also for your extremities. So you can apply it safely multiple times a day, usually up to twice a day, without too much concern about thinning your skin. However, over time, over months and years, even the lower potency topical steroids can cause thinning. And then on the far right-hand side of the column is beta-methasone dipropionate cream and ointment. This is a very uh, strong topical steroid, um, and it's also much more expensive, as you can see. Although um, it's very strong and effective to treat itch, you have to be careful because this is um, only safe for about 20 to 30 applications per month, um, and it's not safe for the face or skin folds where it can lead to thinning even after perhaps um, a one-month application. So you have to be careful with these super strong topical steroids. So now let me introduce the next level of treatment, which would be some oral treatments for itch. Um, now we're not talking about 
prednisone here. We're talking about non-prednisone oral treatments for itch. And the four categories that we're going to talk about here include antihistamines that you've certainly heard of. Um, most of us have taken an antihistamine uh, like uh, Zyrtec, for instance, for <clears throat> allergic symptoms. Well, antihistamines, as the name implies, block the action of histamine, a chemical released by mast cells that can tickle the itch nerve and send that itch signal right to our brain. They are very inexpensive, probably about 20 cents a pill. Um, their effectiveness in treating T-cell lymphoma, though, um, is variable. And I would say that most of the patients that I see in my clinic probably have failed antihistamines for management of their itch. But it certainly is a good place to start. Um, side effects of antihistamines that you're probably aware of is sedation, but some antihistamines can cause dry mouth and urine retention that can be an issue for patients who are older. The best in class antihistamine is probably hydroxyzine. And one reason that dermatologists prescribe a lot of hydroxyzine is because it's very fast acting. So it can help patients quickly. But it also causes a lot of sedation, um, as does doxepin and Benadryl, the two other examples that I have here. So the antihistamines may be good options for patients around bedtime because it can help them sleep better, which is another problem that a lot of patients have. But um, the one that I really want to highlight on this slide is gabapentin. Gabapentin brand name is called Neurontin, but it's available as a generic. And you can see that gabapentin is just as inexpensive as antihistamines in its generic form, so it shouldn't be very expensive for patients. And I consider it the most effective oral treatment for itch among all of those that are listed here, <clears throat> perhaps just underneath prednisone in terms of its efficacy. Unfortunately, gabapentin can cause a lot of sedation, and especially in elderly patients, it can cause dizziness, which we have to be careful of. I've had several patients say that they can only take it at bedtime rather than during the day because they can't think as clearly as they want to, and so patients have to experiment. I always start gabapentin low, perhaps 100 milligrams to 300 milligrams at bedtime, and then I slowly titrate the dose up um, and it can be titrated quite high to almost 900 milligrams three times a day, but you would never want to start at that dose because it would cause extreme sedation and you might be sleeping for 12 to 24 hours. But in general, it's a very safe medication without many um, drug interactions. The next category are antidepressants, and it might be a surprise to see that we use antidepressants to treat itch. Um, and we think that antidepressants can help itch by affecting the way our brain perceives itch. So it kind of works in our brain, of course, and it might make the perception of itch less and therefore let us get through our day without being bothered by itch. It's relatively inexpensive. Antidepressants are the generic forms, that is. And they also can cause sedation and dry mouth. Um, one of them, called mirtazapine, has been studied quite a bit in itch and might be the best option of all antidepressants. Mirtazapine has a side effect that it can increase weight, which may be beneficial to patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma that may have lost weight due to some of the treatments for the disease. Doxepin, you can see, is both an antihistamine and, a, and, an, and an antidepressant. And then paroxetine or Paxil is another one that is shown to help some patients with itch. And then at the far right column, I want to introduce you to a drug called a prepotent or amend. None of the drugs we've talked about so far are actually FDA approved for itch, and this includes a prepotent. A prepotent is approved to help with nausea due to chemotherapy. So if you are receiving chemotherapy for the treatment of your cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and you have itch, you might want to talk to your doctor about trying a prepotent. Unfortunately, it's very expensive in the range of about $40 per pill. And um, this makes it almost um, 100 times more expensive than the other drugs we just looked at. However, there have been quite a few reports in the range of about a dozen showing that a prepotent may help patients with itch, including those with Cesare syndrome, which is the variant of the cutaneous T-cell lymphomas where we see itch most frequently. My personal experience with a prepotent has been mixed. Vanderbilt uh, published the only clinical trial of a prepotent in the treatment of patients with Cesare syndrome. Although we only enrolled five patients, 
it was placebo controlled, so we may have had a better idea about assessing a prepotent. In our study, unfortunately, we did not find a prepotent to be helpful in managing itch. However, it was a very small study, so there could be some benefit to a prepotent, and because it has few side effects, except for fatigue and maybe one out of 10 patients, it might be something worthwhile to explore. Next, I wanted to introduce you to wet wrap therapy. Um, and of all the treatments I've talked about so far, this treatment has transformed the lives of patients with atopic eczema, including small children, or I should say, um, in particular, small children. In several studies, um, children suffering with intractable itching due to their atopic eczema have achieved significant improvement with wet wrap therapy in the range of 70 to 75 percent of children having significant improvement of their atopic eczema. So what do we mean by wet wrap therapy? Um, it's also known as wet pajama routine or wet pajamas routine. Um, and on the right side of the slide, you could see I have a little diagram of pajamas. So you're going to want to get your hands on some thin cotton pajamas, long sleeve, full legs, and do not use flannel pajamas, kind of the thick, um, fuzzy pajamas. You want thin cotton pajamas. And now let me direct your attention to the bottom of the slide where I have um, all those rectangles. And you can see what we're trying to create here is kind of a sandwich um, on your skin. And it starts out with damp skin um, after a shower or a bath. And on top of your damp skin, you're going to place an ointment or cream. Now, this ointment of cream can be um, a bland emollient, such as petroleum jelly or aquaphor or vanna cream or others. But your doctor may instruct you to apply triamcinolone cream or ointment or some other topical steroid. So on top of the ointment or cream, you're going to put on a pair of damp, not ringing, but a damp pair of pajamas. And then on top of the damp pajamas, you're going to put on a pair of dry pajamas. And I know this sounds kind of silly and maybe even a little bit barbaric. Why would I want to put something damp on my skin, but the idea behind wet wrap therapy is that what we're doing is we're driving water into the skin along with the ointment um, or perhaps topical steroid that's also against the wet skin and kind of sandwich. So it's kind of we're creating kind of an ointment sandwich on your skin with water on both sides and that drives the topical steroids um, and the emollients deep into your skin. So how long do you wear this? Um, wet pajama uh, concoction, I guess we'll call it. Um, most people will lie in bed under the covers because you could chill with this therapy for several hours. There are patients that may sleep the entire night like this, but most patients can't tolerate that. So many patients will try this in the evening, maybe for one to three hours, change into dry clothes, and then go to sleep. Um, and you might find it to be very effective. So discuss with your doctor about whether or not you should be using just simply an emollient or a moisturizing cream or ointment for your skin, or whether or not your itch is severe enough um, to warrant using a prescription strength topical steroid. So that's wet wrap pajama. And then as we move up to scale of treatments for itch, um, I wanna say a few things about phototherapy. On your left, that's what a modern phototherapy unit looks like in a dermatologist's office. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of like an upright tanning bed but the rays that are emitted from uh, the dermatologist phototherapy unit are different than tanning bed rays. I really want to discourage you from going to your local tanning bed to see if it can help your itch. Um, I think it's really important that the care of your itch and your cutaneous T cell lymphoma is managed by um, healthcare providers, nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners that have experience in managing um, your disease but it has benefits. It can help not only the itch, but your cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and it treats most of your skin all at once. Perhaps, I guess, the scalp and the bottom of your feet. But the rest of your skin is bathed in this ultraviolet light, and it turns out that ultraviolet light can knock out a lot of the cells that are contributing to your T-cell lymphoma, but also to itch. But there are disadvantages, and one disadvantage is the travel back and forth to the dermatologist's office. And many patients have to go two to three times a week, um, which becomes quite a hassle. And also, because it's ultraviolet light, as you might expect, um, it can increase your risk of skin cancers. 
And um, you may be familiar with two types of phototherapy. One is PUVA and the other is narrowband UVB phototherapy. The good news for narrowband UVB phototherapy is we have not seen an increased risk of skin cancers despite, use it, despite using it now for several decades. And then finally, there's the cost. Um, and for some patients, it could be costly to go back and forth uh, to a dermatologist's office. Um, systemic steroids, they are also um, a pretty effective way uh, to treat itch. And um, they can also reduce the skin redness and cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Another advantage of steroids is they that they can act pretty quickly to help many of your symptoms. Um, it's also available in pills like prednisone, or you can get a shot of steroids at your dermatologist's office. And then finally, um, it's uh, available in, a, in, in an intravenous form. Now, there are many disadvantages, which is why I don't always um, advocate for systemic steroids. And the biggest one is that it will increase your risk for infection because it turns the volume down on your immune system. It can also increase a bunch of other things that are, uh, we're trying to avoid in most of our patients, such as increasing your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your eye pressure. So if you have glaucoma, you need to stay away from systemic steroids. You can see fluid retention and leg swelling. It can increase your appetite and your weight uh, when you may not want that to happen. And in the elderly, uh, they can have psychiatric symptoms and even have hallucinations. Over time, systemic steroids can thin your bones and cause the adrenal gland, which is a gland in your skin, not your skin, but, but your abdominal cavity that produces your own steroid. Um, and um, when your adrenal glands shut down, it makes it difficult to wean off of uh, systemic steroids. And sometimes as you go down on your systemic steroids, you'll find that your itch can flare and so can your skin redness. So I tried my best to keep patients off of systemic steroids, but if my patient's quality of life is absolutely miserable, um, there is a role for systemic steroids. And finally, a brief discussion about investigational treatments. You'll be happy to know that there's a clinical trial actively enrolling patients right now that is using um, a pretty unique topical lotion. It's called naloxone, and it's a lotion that's applied to the skin. It's um, safe, so most patients do not experience um, a lot of itching and burning to this lotion. Um, and the clinical trial is being done in patients with mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, the two most common variants of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And um, in order to enroll, patients with those diseases have to have an itch intensity um, greater than five. And most scales of itch go from one to 10, where 10 is the worst imaginable itch. Um, to find um, centers that are actively recruiting for this clinical trial, um, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. And I also know that the cutaneous lymphoma website um, also lists uh, clinical trials for mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. I am a principal investigator at Vanderbilt in this clinical trial, and I look forward to enrolling more patients in it. And then I won't waste too much more time because I want to get to your questions, but you could see at the bottom of this slide, there are quite a few other drugs of interest that are being looked at in clinical trials, not specifically for mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome, but usually for diseases like atopic eczema. The first one I should mention, and that's uh, nemolizumab. And nemolizumab is a very interesting drug because it targets the IL-31 receptor. And you might recall from one of my previous slides that IL-31 is a chemical released from malignant T cells and also from reactive T cells. And both of those cells are usually in high quantity in the skin of patients with T cell lymphomas. And if we could block the action of IL-31, we might be able to help itch. It turns out that IL-31 is also important in eczema. And um, if you wanted to, you can look at a New England Journal of Medicine article from March 2017, where a large study looking at this drug in the treatment of itch and atopic eczema was published. And the drug is given as an, um, a subcutaneous injection once a month, and it helps reduce itch in many patients in the range of about 30 to 40%. 
So that's certainly a, um, a drug worth uh, following into the future. And there are others listed there. But I wanted to get to my last slide so that we can get to questions, because I know that's why you're watching and online right now. And in summary, <clears throat> just remember to use lukewarm, not hot water, and to use fragrance-free skin products. And um, unscented products are OK, but fragrance-free products are better. Um, and this is an important pillar of just good skincare in general. Next, I want you to think about asking the doctor helping to take care of you um, if gabapentin pills may be a good option to help manage your itch. They certainly have been helpful in many of my patients, um, but I will say that there are some patients that even at the highest doses of gabapentin still suffer with itch, um, but it certainly has helped more patients than it hasn't. Next, I want you to ask your doctor if wet wrap therapy or the wet pajama routine might be a good option to help your itch. And if they think it is, you can ask if they would recommend that you apply a topical steroid all over your skin, or should you apply uh, just an emollient like petroleum jelly? Both can be um, effective. And then finally, and this is probably the most important thing I wanna emphasize, is I don't want you to feel guilty about scratching. I remember going to um, a symposium on itch, and they had um, a parent of a child who was suffering from eczema. And they talked about how um, the children is often um, kind of told to feel guilty about scratching their skin, and they're constantly being told, stop scratching, stop scratching, stop scratching. Um, and it could really play an emotional toll on not only a small child, uh, but adults who have diseases like atopic eczema and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So um, you shouldn't feel guilty about scratching your skin. And for the caregivers that are out there listening, you shouldn't make um, your loved ones feel guilty about scratching your skin um, and encourage them to try some of the other tips that we've just talked about and I've introduced uh, to you. Um, so with that, I want to thank you. And we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I'm excited to answer them. Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. Great. Thank you, Dr. Zick. Uh, it, I found it very helpful. And thinking back to the days when I was at um, gosh, I could use some of the tips. But we weren't thinking about that 20, almost 30 years ago. So, so we've come a long way. And um, I'll also mention we do have the, um, the naloxone clinical trial on the website with all the different sites that are currently open, so you can check that out as well. And I would encourage anybody, especially if you're dealing with serious issues, to consider um, participating, because that'll... Can you maybe share a little bit about why, you know, it, it just seems to be in this... Uh, when you start scratching, it just gets worse. Like, what? why is it that loop? right? Like it, you have a minute of relief and then all of a sudden like your whole body is itching. I've heard that idea? so many times, Susan, and I tend to call it the itch frenzy. And mm -hmm. one thing I didn't mention, but I'm glad to mention now, is that not only does the itch signal travel from our skin to our brain, but the brain can send a kind of a retrograde signal down the spinal thalamic tract through the itch nerve where it can cause the itch nerve to release chemicals in the skin we call neuropeptides. And these can intensify the itch, not only where you have the itch, but it can also send and trigger the itch nerve to release these neuropeptides in places that you aren't even itching when the itch started. So it creates this itch frenzy and this cycle of scratching and itching. So many of my patients have talked about that. And this is where an important roll for ice can happen. So if you think about um, using ice to put out a small wildfire before you have like a conflagration in a forest fire, and by applying ice to that site where you're just starting to itch, you might be able to knock it out before you end up with that itch frenzy that you just um, suggested, Susan. Great point. Great question. Very, very good tip. I used ice a lot, actually. Worked mm -hmm. well for me. Um, okay, here's our first question. Gabapentin doesn't seem to be working as well anymore. Any, suggest any suggestions? Well, um, 
you can ask your doctor if um, he or she can prescribe um, a prepotent or an antidepressant uh, that might be helpful in managing your itch. Um, usually we would start with that. Um, also, you might want to ask your doctor if you would be a good candidate um, for phototherapy and then wet wrap therapy. Um, most dermatologists have experience recommending wet wrap therapy. And the um, formula or recipe that I gave you um, might be a little bit different than your doctor. But I think in patients who are failing gabapentin, um, I would certainly consider phototherapy, I would consider wet wrap therapy, and I would consider trying another oral agent, perhaps um, antidepressants or a prepotent, if you can get your insurance to cover it. Hmm. Yeah, always a challenge. Always Susan, I'm gonna read this next one because it's a little too long to fit into our little chat bubble, if that's okay. Um, okay. Let me go ahead and grab that. Um, I'm using Valcor, which is working great, but increases the itching. Any suggestions? Just finished 11 Brentuximab Vidotin uh, treatments and had no itch, but 3% body surface area left to clean up. It's itches for hours after it's showered off. So I can uh, repeat the question just to make sure that everyone heard it. And the question is, um, how can we treat the itch associated with Valclor gel? Um, Valclor gel is a treatment for cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Um, and unfortunately, many of the topical treatments we have to actually treat the disease can often lead to some irritation, which can lead to itching. And so you can discuss with your doctor, but what I do um, with Valclor gel is I may have the patient apply it in the morning, and then throughout the day, maybe three to four hours later, I'll have patients apply a medium potency topical steroid, such as triamcinolone ointment or cream to the sites that are treated, um, and we have no evidence that this decreases the efficacy. So you can use both Valclor gel and a topical steroid um, the same day, um, and that may help to decrease um, the irritation. Also, I want to remind you and encourage the listener to go back to my slide about good skincare because you can follow all of those good skincare recommendations. Um, and finally, although this would be um, a little bit extreme to treat the irritation of, of Alclor gel, you can also consider uh, wet wrap therapy perhaps after dinner. And you don't want to definitely use wet wrap therapy every day. That would be pretty cumbersome. But what most people find is using wet wrap therapy perhaps uh, maybe once a day for a week and then um, using it perhaps every other day or several times per week can be really helpful. Good question. All right. So can you take hydroxyzine and gabapentin together? That's a great question because um, both gabapentin and hydroxyzine can cause sedation. Um, in my experience, yes, you can combine hydroxyzine and gabapentin. There is a but, and that but is if you're on a maximum dose of gabapentin, which uh, for my patients is about 900 milligrams to 1200 milligrams three times daily, and you're taking a maximum dose of hydroxyzine, which in my practice is probably about 50 to 75 milligrams um, at bedtime. Um, that combination can make you very sleepy. And you can have, um, you might have problems if you have to get up during the middle of the night, um, let's say to go to the restroom. Um, you're putting yourself at risk for falling. And of course, when you fall, um, you, bad things can happen like breaking bones or lacerations and things like that. So that would be the biggest concern. Um, there is not much concern about um, causing uh, breathing difficulty or um, causing seizures or something like that. It really has to do with the sedation and perhaps some of the dizziness that can occur if you're heavily sedated. That makes sense, but hopefully you don't have to get up. Okay, everyone talks about how much they itch, but I don't itch hardly at all. Is this normal? <laughs> Um, it's, um, it's lucky. <laughs> um, and I'll say that um, we kind of assume 
um, because of this talk and how many treatments we have to treat itch, that all patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma suffer greatly with itch. Uh, but it turns out that in the earliest stages of mycosis fungoides, when you have um, kind of a scaly pink patch or rash, maybe on your buttocks or breasts or in a sun protected area, early on, there may be no symptoms at all. And you may be fortunate and have no symptoms for many, many years, um, and, or at all for that matter. Um, but there are patients, and we haven't figured out why some patients itch and others don't. I'm unaware of any studies um, to show that patients who itch do more poorly uh, than patients who don't itch. So if you are suffering with itch and you have cutaneous lymphoma, um, do not uh, worry that that's a, a sign that you're going to have um, a, a more difficult time treating the T-cell lymphoma in general. And one thing I really haven't mentioned is that treating the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and knocking out those T-cells in your skin will eventually help itch. So most of the things I've talked about right now are really meant to help you in that time period between the onset of your treatment and response to treatment. Because almost universally, patients that have significant clearing of their skin also have significant improvement of their itch. It may not go away entirely, but you can expect to have significant improvement of your itch. And I should also mention, because of that one question about Valclor, that there are quite a few treatments um, for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, uh, mostly topical, but there are some systemic treatments that um, may dry your skin out and lead to itch in and of itself. So you can have itch from the disease, you can have itch from some of the treatments, but that's where your healthcare provider comes in uh, to hopefully improve your quality of life. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's the biggest challenge, right, is, is it might take a while for the treatment that you're on to, to work, so if you're really itchy, how do you manage that in that mm -hmm. interim time frame so that you can get through and hopefully the treatment works. So all good right. stuff, right? Um, let's see. Uh, would, re would wet wrap, say that three times fast, <laughs> would wet wrap therapy encourage skin fungus? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I like that question because when you think about skin fungus, you think about it um, um, developing in areas where you might perspire a little bit more, like the bottom of your feet or the groin. Um, so you might be worried about whether or not um, um, sleeping or at least resting for several hours in damp pajamas might increase the growth of uh, fungus. Um, there are no data to prove that um, doing wet wrap therapy will increase the risk of any infection. As a matter of fact, in children with atopic eczema that are doing wet wrap therapy, it helps their eczema so much that infections are decreased with wet wrap therapy. And there are so many similarities between the itch and the rash of atopic eczema and the itch and the rash of uh, mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome that if you discover um, a new treatment for itch that's FDA approved for atopic eczema, you should look to see if there are uh, doctors that are devoting their lives to T-cell lymphoma that have started to use it to treat itch and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. But that's a great question, but I wouldn't consider that because your skin is dry most of the day, but only for that three hour period of time. So your skin will eventually dry and with, your, with the integrity of your skin, better. Think of your skin as like a brick wall. And if you have a dilapidated brick wall, water and air and other pollutants can get right through the wall. But if you have a strong brick wall with good mortar between all the bricks, um, it's less likely to allow um, allergens and infections to get into the skin. Um, and wet wrap therapy can do that. It can kind of rehabilitate uh, the dilapidated brick wall of your skin. Right, so pay attention to your skin um, uh, topical, your just regular skin maintenance is, is really a good, a good thing to do for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I started Potaglio about five weeks ago and my itching has increased. Any possible reasons? Hmm. Okay. Mogamaluzumab. 
Yes, yes. So Pateglio is also known as Mogamaluzumab. And for patients that may have failed uh, some oral and perhaps even skin-directed treatments for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, their doctors may have discussed Mogamaluzumab with them. Well, it turns out that uh, Mogamaluzumab, along with some other treatments for CTCL, um, can sometimes um, increase um, itch. And that may be because uh, mogamaluzumab, in order to knock out uh, the malignant T cells, um, it has to recruit other immune system cells to the scene um, to knock out the T cells. And some of those cells are called uh, neutrophil cells. And you need neutrophil cells because they're important in fighting off bacterial infection. But if mogamaluzumab, like a little flag attaching to the malignant cell, is recruiting neutrophil cells to the skin, um, it, neutrophils can release chemicals that might transiently increase um, itch. Now, if your itch is severe, you can talk to your doctor about whether or not um, some intermittent prednisone can help that. Certainly topical steroids and everything we talked about um, during my short presentation may be helpful. But I think it has to do with uh, the immune reaction that mogamaluzumab um, is inciting in the skin as it's uh, trying to knock out the T cell lymphoma. Yeah, so one of those things where it's probably doing its job, but in that short term time period has uh, an adverse side effect that maybe you need to figure out how to manage for that time. So, is it a good idea to use narrow band in between Valcor for maintenance? Okay. Well, by narrow band, we mean narrow band UVB phototherapy. And um, just as a refresher, Valclor gel is an FDA approved topical treatment for mycosis fungoides. And uh, Valclor is a brand name for meclorethamine um, that's been around for probably over um, almost uh, a century, as a matter of fact. And um, meclorethamine or nitrogen mustard, um, early on when we used nitrogen mustard mixed in an ointment base or even a liquid base, um, there were some concerns about uh, inducing skin cancers, and therefore we would not be recommending the use of uh, meclorethamine, um, now Valclor, or, and a narrow band phototherapy at the same time, because we were worried about initiating skin cancers. However, um, in the clinical trials and more recent experience um, indicates that that concern uh, for nitrogen mustard, meclorethamine, or Valclor gel, all the same thing, triggering skin cancers is probably much less than expected. So um, I am less concerned about combining narrowband UVB and Valclor. As a matter of fact, um, most of the time you're going to be using Valclor in areas that are hard to get to with phototherapy, and that would be the skin folds, um, the buttocks, the genital area. And so because those areas aren't normally getting a lot of narrowband UVB exposure, um, there's probably not a lot of overlap with those areas. So um, yeah, certainly not opposed um, to using and combining Valclor gel with narrowband UVB phototherapy. It's a great question. Thank you. Good question. All right. What do you suggest for scalp itch? Hmm, it's a good one. Uh, it is a good one because you think about... Most of the things that I talked about topically, um, although you can apply ice to your scalp, um, you're going to get a pretty wicked brain freeze as if you just gulped down a whole scoop of ice cream. So that's not going to work. But I will say this, um, you might be able to find a, um, a cool pack that certainly isn't as cold as ice that you might be able to apply to an itchy spot on your scalp. So instead of applying ice, which is, of course, about 32 degrees, maybe you can find something that's around 45 degrees or 50 degrees um, to help with itching on your scalp. Um, but that's not something that you can do when you're out at public or you're out at work. So fortunately, there are a number of topical steroids that come in a lotion or a solution. And these can be massaged um, into the hair and to your scalp skin uh, to help with itching. However, most patients who have severe itch um, of the scalp need to use um, a dr an oral drug such as gabapentin, antihistamines, 
um, and sometimes even antidepressants to help that itch. Um, and sometimes the itch on the scalp is the last to improve because it's difficult uh, to treat the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma on the scalp because a lot of our topical therapies, um, it's just difficult to get there. Um, I don't think Valclor gel um, can be massaged easily into hair-bearing scalp. Um, um, so we're kind of left with potent topical steroids in a solution form, and that's what I usually do. Hmm. Okay, well, something to try, right, if, you're, if you have really yeah. itchy scalp. And, okay. um, Susan, we have one last question that I'm going to read. It's another one of those long ones. Okay, okay so here we go. Um, I was initially diagnosed with pyoderma gangrenous. The itching turned to painful lesions. After over six months, they, biopsed, they biopsied me and found cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. I went over six months of CHOP chemo. Almost all of my lesions healed, except for one. I'm currently on rituximab and have seen some progress, but had a seizure and had to stop. I'm stage three, and I was hoping to get a stem cell transplant, but I have to be in remission. So any thoughts on that? Sure, sure. Um, so um, uh, as you may know, there are different skin stages of mycosis fungoides. Um, the patch stage, the plaque stage, which is kind of a thick, uh, thicker plateau, raised plateau of skin, and then the tumor stage, which is more kind of a, a dome-shaped um, skin lesion. And some of the tumors of uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma can form an open sore, an ulcer. And um, occasionally the ulcers can be large. And uh, in some cases, the ulcer of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma might be mistaken for um, another skin disease that can produce ulcers called pyoderma gangrenosum. And there's no relationship between pyoderma gangrenosum and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, except that they both can present with um, ulcerations on the skin. So um, bravo to the physician that um, did a skin biopsy to diagnose cutaneous T-cell lymphoma after you were um, diagnosed with a different diagnosis before. I'm also happy to hear that um, most, if not all, of your um, ulcerations on the skin have responded to the treatment that your doctor has given you. Um, now, if you do have um, one or two skin lesions that don't seem to be responding um, to the treatment, um, in other words, um, they seem to be a little bit resistant to the treatment, um, that's when you might want to ask your doctor if it's time to biopsy that particular skin lesion just to make sure that it is the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and it isn't some other condition that may mimic cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, like um, a skin cancer, like squamous cell carcinoma, uh, or something like that. So I would first um, confirm that uh, a few of those skin lesions that aren't responding are indeed cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And one thing that we do once we confirm that diagnosis is you might want to discuss with your doctor whether or not radiation treatment um, could be an option for you just to treat perhaps the one, two, or even three or four of uh, skin lesions that um, did not respond to the intravenous treatments that you discussed with us. So good luck. I hope my suggestions are helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's, thank you. And that's all of them, Susan. We're all set there. Yeah, right on time. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Dr. Zick, for a really great presentation and discussion on itch. As always, I learn a lot, and uh, hopefully, I'm sure everybody found this very, very valuable because always a hot topic, and we really appreciate your taking the time. And I loved your animated slides. I thought, great. I mean, for the first time. <laughs> I thought they were a little <laughs> cheesy, but thank you for the compliment, uh, Susan. <laughs> no, I think they, I thought they were great because it really showed kind of how that how that all works, you know, in a nice in a nice visual. Because it's hard to explain sometimes you know, the actual right. medical. So thank you. Well, really appreciate that. It's been my that. pleasure. Um, and I look forward and I'm going to certainly encourage my patients uh, to check in once a month with the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation for these Facebook live presentations, because it really gives um, doctors and healthcare providers 
um, a lot more time to do a deep dive into a specific subject area, um, a lot more time than we typically have during um, a clinical encounter with a patient. So thank you for the invitation. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm so glad. And yeah, I, it's been really fun. And I'm, I'm really glad we're able to do this because we can, you can be in your office and I can be in mine and we can just have a chat and people can be right there at their own home computers. And um, as much as I love doing our live programs and you've been fabulous helping us with those over the years, you know, not everybody can get to those. Um, although now we're live streaming those as well, which is great. But, um, but in the interim, uh, we'll be able to do these and do more often. And we'll be back next month um, with another Facebook Live. And uh, have a great, I'm just going to thank Dr. Zick one more time and have a great evening and the rest of your night. And we look forward to uh, having you back on the program and seeing you again soon.